morning session with uh, Colm Knockton. We'll speak about instantaneous generation explosive condensation in non equilibrium cluster growth. Okay, thank you very much. I'd first like to just uh, thank the organizers of this meeting for the opportunity to come here and uh, see this wonderful new uh, campus which is uh, growing up here. It's going to be a fantastic place, I think, and uh, I'm really happy to be here. So I want to uh, talk today about um, some work I've been doing um, with uh, Stefan Graskinski, who some of you know uh, from here, and our, our PhD student, uh, Yushi Chow uh, at Warwick, and actually just uh, defended his thesis last week. And I should really be honest and sort of give, give credit where it's due. I mean, most, of, most of the hard parts of this, the, the, the substantive work, have been done by these guys. So let me just uh, start with uh, just a tiny bit of motivation to tell you the kind of problems that I'm interested in. And, um, you know, want to talk about kinetics of non-equilibrium particle growth. And I guess I don't need to spend a lot of time with this audience kind of arguing that such problems are important and interesting, probably more importantly. Um, but the, the, um, you know, the main thing I just want to make clear is that when I talk about non-equilibrium growth, I'm mostly interested in, in, in sort of problems where you have um, sort of population level, level growth of uh, basically populations of, of, of particles which grow due to some kind of mass exchange event. So I'm not really, you know, this is not going to be about a sort of detailed structure of individual particle growth like diffusion limited aggregation or it's not about surface interface growth it's about basically um, population level uh, statistical dynamics of, of, of uh, uh, interacting particle systems which produce growing clusters in some sense so there's kind of different mechanisms uh, that one might uh, propose which uh, all fall into this kind of class of, of problems one is kind of just aggregation which is probably the thing that I've worked on uh, most in, in this business and uh, you know, aggregation basically means when you have two particles in this cloud uh, when, when they collide with some probability they just merge to form a bigger particle and so obviously this leads to growth. Uh, exchange driven growth is another a sort of um, interaction mechanism which can uh, give rise to growth of typical cluster size and exchange driven growth I'll explain in a little more detail in the next slide it's you know basically when, when two when two droplets or two clusters interact, then with some probability they exchange a single unit of mass or a single monomer is exchanged between the two. And Ostwald ripening, it's just a classical model of, of, uh, of, of, of um, phase separation. And th this is you know, rather similar to exchange driven growth, where uh, again, growth is mediated by exchange of monomers, but kind of difference between these two is that, uh, you know, in, in the, at least in the, in the usual formulation of the Ostwald ripening, uh, you don't necessarily need, uh, uh, two, two particles don't, two, two droplets don't need to interact with each other directly in order to exchange a monomer. You can kind of, you can sponta a large droplet can spontaneously emit a monomer, which can be reabsorbed by someone else. So you don't necessarily need a collision to happen, for example. Okay, so let me just start by saying uh, what exchange-driven growth is, because it's going to be relevant to what I want to talk about later, and it's probably the least well-known, probably, of these, of these three models. So, so schematically, it's basically this. You have a pair, uh, you know, this, this notation here means an, a, a droplet of mass I and a droplet of mass J, and so when they interact, then with some probability, which is typically um, dependent on the sizes, uh, the, you, know, you make this transition where one of them is going to gain a single unit and then the other, the other one um, will, will, will lose a unit. And you know, this interaction kernel Kij gives the rate at which this, uh, typically, at which this process uh, happens. And at the mean field level, if you, you can write down, as, as almost everyone begins with to study these kind of problems, you invoke the idea of law of mass action, and you write down some chemical kinetics uh, describing the time evolution of the average concentration of uh, particles of size k, and uh, this is the equation uh, which you'll write down to account for uh, gain and loss of, of mass um, due to this exchange interaction. Um, you typically solve this, you know, this is a deterministic set of equations, you solve it with 
some initial mon so-called monodispersed initial conditions, so on, only monomer is present. Yeah. Why are the rates for gain of mass uh, They don't have to be, uh, but in this model they are. Uh, it gets rather in these models there can be a bit of a, a zoo of, of, of possibilities. And I guess the important thing to note about it is that there's just a single conserved quantity for these equations. Single global conserved quantity is the, the total mass uh, contained in the system. And you know, these, if, you, if you want to find out more about how these equations behave, uh, there's this paper by Eli ben Naim and Paul Krapivsky, which go into great detail. And I'll come back to that later. The second mechanism is irreversible aggregation. So upon interaction, clusters just merge. So an imer and a jmer just go to give a single particle of, of mass i plus j. And the mass action kinetics for this kind of interaction is given by Smolochowski's equation, which is a more uh, sort of complicated uh, set of equations, obviously, because um, you, know, you have uh, much more, you know, uh, much more type uh, sizes of particle interact, <coughs> much more uh, types of particle are allowed to interact with each other. Uh, I've written it down here uh, in, a, in a continuous formulation uh, with integrals over the sizes. Uh, you can equally well write it as a set of discrete differential equations for uh, assuming integer uh, masses. And that's probably actually, I mean, mostly when I'm talking about this, I'm kind of thinking discreetly anyway. It doesn't actually matter for most of the kind of scaling properties which I want to talk about today. Uh, whether you're discrete or continuous, not, re not relevant. Um, so I suppose, I mean, the, 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 just very quickly on this equation, it's, it's got quite an old history. It's a, nearly 100 years old now. Uh, the first term here, the positive term, uh, just describes how you are, you know, it's, it's, you're increasing the number of particles of mass m. How does it happen? Well, a part, two smaller particles uh, whose masses sum to m uh, merge at some rate given by the kernel, and then the mass action kinetics says that that rate should also be proportional to the uh, densities of the two, of the two uh, droplet sizes going into the collision. And then you integrate over all possible um, ways that that can happen. And then the negative term is you know, the, the loss of uh, clusters of size m, and so that just happens when a cl uh, cluster already of size m interacts with anyone else. And it becomes bigger, so it counts with a minus sign against the budget for m's. And so that's kind of, you know, verbally the derivation of this equation. Um, one extra feature I just want to point out, which I've added in, which typically would not be, if you look at this equation, nine, nine times out of ten in the literature, you won't see this upper cutoff, capital M. Uh, this cutoff would be a little important for what I want to talk about uh, later. And it's basically a maximum size. And if you implement it this way, so you just cut off the last term, then it acts as a sink. So basically, the, any mergers which result in the formation of a cluster which is larger than M, that cluster is basically removed from the system. So it breaks. The, so, so if that M was set to infinity, you'd have a formal conservation of the total amount of mass in the system. But with this capital M present, uh, you don't. I mean, you break the mass conservation explicitly, and mass can, if, if clusters become big enough, they're basically removed. So it's kind of a sink. Uh, you can have a source of monomers if you want. Uh, that's, I'm not going to talk about that today, so you can ignore. Now, in many applications, this uh, kernel here, which gives the rate at which particles of different sizes merge with each other, is, is a homogeneous function. And um, I want to introduce a little bit of notation here. And this is maybe, a, a, you know, if you already haven't fallen asleep or become kind of frozen into a catatonic state, try to wake up uh, just for a moment, because this note, just what these exponents are is going to matter uh, for most of the rest of the talk. So if you get lost here, you're and won't really know what I'm on about quite a bit of the rest of the time. So, so, so this kernel is, in many applications, homogeneous. I've given a couple of examples here. Uh, these are just things I plucked from the literature. There are many, many more. Uh, the point of picking, writing down some particular kernels is not necessarily that I'm going to talk about these, but just rather to give you the sense that it's worth uh, taking a parametric view of this problem uh, and, and study the kind of classes of scaling kernels, because there are many of them that you'll find describing particular microphysics. 
So first of all, so, so with this homogeneous kernel, I wanted to, if, if you scale the masses by some amount A, then the overall kernel scales with some exponent, which you're going to call 2 gamma. So that's the first thing. So that the exponent gamma is very important for describing, for, for the scaling properties of the system, clearly. Uh, but it's not by itself sufficient to classify all kind of types of behavior you might observe. Uh, the second sort of an additional bit of detail is required which is not just the overall degree of homogeneity, but rather how that homogeneity is distributed when you look at the asymptotics of collisions involving particles which are widely differing in size. So the collision, how, how does the kernel behave when you have uh, mergers between very large and very small particles? So to describe that asymptotically, I'm going to introduce two additional exponents, mu and nu. So when you have a part when M2 is, is much, much bigger than M1, then the, scale, the kernel scales as M1 to the power of mu, so that's the smaller of the two, and then the scaling with the bigger of the two is M2 to the nu. And then clearly these three are not independent, so the, these exponents mu and nu should sum up to two lambda. So that's kind of there. And so here's a couple of examples, Brownian coagulation of spherical droplets, if you look at these rules. And nu is one third, mu is minus one third for this kernel. Um, gravitational settling in, in, a, in a, a, a laminar flow, uh, nu is four thirds, mu is zero. And you can find many, many other examples of things with different kernels. Does it mean that if the kernels diverge? I remember that. I think it worked, did it? Yes. Uh, when mu is equal to one, minus one-third, the kernel diverges when m1 goes to zero. Is it indeed what you said? Yep. That's true. But, but m1, yeah. I mean, this is where, for a question like this, maybe this question of whether I'm discrete or not starts to matter. Because if you, um, you know, the smallest mass is one in, in, in my thinking. So you're never really diverging. At small things, but but scaling functions. If you look at so, sort of you know scaling relative the, the mass by the typical size, then indeed the you know things can diverge as you look at the limit of very small masses. All right, so let's go on. So, so, so put in talking about these uh, kernels with uh, scaling uh, properties, then clearly you might uh, expect that the solution of this of the Smoluchowski equation itself exhibits some kind of dynamical scaling, and indeed it does. So you can look for uh, solutions having the form where the, the, basically the dependence on mass and time uh, is, uh, comes about in this, you know, you rescale the mass by some typical mass uh, or some characteristic size S of t, and uh, putting in sort of this scaling form, uh, you can look for self-similar solutions, um, this which... Is the case without input. This is the case without input. So the, kind of numerically, you see this kind of thing. Initially, you have lots of small particles. As the aggregation proceeds, you generate, you deplete the small ones. So the overall uh, amplitude goes down, but you start to create a tail of bigger ones. And as time goes on, it spreads. Uh, dis mass distribution spreads to the right in the, in the mass space. And if you rescale things properly, according to the self-similar ansatz, you see, well, OK, it's, it's a nice uh, data collapse there. Now, this is, now, things can be interesting. So this is the first sort of interesting thing I want to tell you, and that's uh, well, this so-called gelation transition. So it's kind of, you know, no one will argue, microscopically, the dynamics here conserve mass. So, so when you have mergers between two clusters of different sizes, the, the one that comes out of that merger is the, has the mass of the two ones that went in. So formally, at least, the Smolikovsky equation conserves the total mass. So if you work, compute the first moment of uh, the size distribution, it's formally conserved. However, interestingly, people found when they looked at this a little more carefully that if this exponent, uh, so this degree of homogeneity of the kernel which I introduced, if that uh, degree of homogeneity is bigger than one, then it was found in the late 70s and early 80s that actually this uh, mass conservation can break. So in particular, there's a time t star above which the first moment of the mass distribution is less than the initial one. So um, this 
finding that the mean field theory can violate mass conservation is known as gelation transition. So it's a, it's a kind of a transition which happens kinetically in time. You know, it's a, it, when you say transition, it's not something where you change some parameter and look at how some steady state changes rather, but it's rather a transition which happens in time. So the, you know, to, to, to understand how this violation of mass conservation kind of comes about, it's actually much, much, it makes a lot more sense to first introduce this mass cutoff M so you essentially regularize everything. There's no, uh, you know, I guess the point about this, you know, what happens here, you know, the, at this time T star, um, the second moment of the size distribution diverges. So there's some, if, if, the, if the kernel is growing fast enough as a function of the masses, then uh, the, the, the kinetic equation has some finite time singularity. And that's what allows this mass conservation to break. Um, so the second moment diverges, this means the typical cluster size goes to infinity in a finite time. You're essentially able to transport mass uh, all the way to infinity, and that, this can be in some sense lost. So the, the, the best way to study it is to introduce this cutoff, which I mentioned, and then just study the, you know, this makes everything finite. There's no longer any singularity. You have a finite system of differential equations. Solution exists for all times. Um, but you can study the limit of that solution as m goes to infinity. And what you find is, you know, here illustrated kind of numerically, just to give you a sort of a sense of what this viol seeming violation of mass conservation does. So this, the different lines are showing the total mass contained in the system as a function of time for several different values of this cutoff, increasing from red through to purple. So you see initially, if we look at the red curve first, mass is conserved for a while. And then you get to a time where the clusters start to become comparable with the cutoff. And then any mergers which produce bigger clusters, they're then removed. And so the, the mass then starts to go down. So nothing is mysterious there. The interesting thing, that, however, is that as you make the cutoff get larger and larger, it's going here from 10 to 3 up to 10 to the 9. You know, this curve, these curves converge. There's a kind of a fixed time uh, at which you always start to produce clusters bigger than the cutoff. So essentially, this is a kind of an explosive process, which no matter how big you make your cutoff, you can always get there within a fixed amount of time. Paul, yep. Is it fair to say that if you introduce you know, an additional part of the distribution at infinity, there is conservation of mass at exactly. the delta peak at infinity right. that accumulates? Now. Right. That, that's, and that's exactly what people do. So people call this the reason where the name comes from. This came from the polymer physics literature originally, and people thought of this delta peak at infinity as being a gel. So they call it, as, you know, the gel is somehow a, a, an, infinite, a, a, an infinite sized particle which is somehow everywhere. And, and so, so, so that, that's where the name comes from. And indeed, if you account properly for the gel, then, uh, then, then you conserve mass. But it's not totally simple because you need to also specify how the regular particles interact with the gel once, it's, once it forms. And you have some freedom of how to do this. So there's different ways of, of, of regularizing this. And so, and they'll all, so all such solutions will look the same up until this gel time. But the dynamics afterwards will depend on how you've specified the interaction between the gel and the rest. So there's a kind of a you know, slight issue there. Another question. Starting with the microscopic dynamics. Yeah. It is, yes. I should say, I should emphasize this. Yeah, absolutely. So if I start with a particular microscopic dynamic, will that be able to go specify how your gel is transported into the other part? Yeah. So that provides a specific regularization. Yeah. That's true. But so, so what happens if, I mean, if you so, so so if you would take this point of view and start from say a, a Markov chain which describes this aggregation process here, uh, what you find is that basically the population will separate into uh, kind of two parts which scale differently in the limit of infinite system size. So so you should somehow you know you if you want to describe different interactions with the gel you should prescribe some sort of different interaction uh, rule for when particles get very, very big. And you can probably do that in a consistent way, but you would need to scale that interaction in the right way with the size of the, you know, the, essentially the number of initial particles. So T star depends on the initial mass? Um, it depends on the initial mass, yes, it does. Okay, so, so 
that's kind of, in some sense, physical interpretation of gelation transition. Let me get on to what I actually want to talk about, which is the more pathological case. And this is where people usually really start not you know, asking questions and protesting and so on. So, so, so OK. This, this gelation transition can happen instantaneously, at least at mean field level. And the, part of what I want to kind of get you to think about today is, well, what does that even, does that even mean anything? And I would argue it does. So, so what these guys found, uh, so, so this basically, if, you know, we have this mu plus nu is two lambda. So this gelation transition happens when two lambda equals one. So, so if you fix mu exponent, then gelation will always occur if this <coughs> new, guy, new exponent is big enough. But what Van Dongen and Ernst and well, various other people, I mean, I guess they sort of expressed it most clearly uh, based on work by others, is that if nu is greater than 1, they found that this t star, this gel time, is 0. So essentially, you could transfer mass to infinite size within 0 time if you would take the Smolikovsky equation literally. But even worse than that, I mean, this is already kind of somewhat difficult to believe, but even worse, they found that the gelation for, for the, such systems is complete in the sense that the mass in the system is zero for any positive time. So you have some singularity, very highly singular behavior which happens more or less instantaneously and solution makes no sense for any positive times. So you might think, well, instantaneously gelling kernels you know, they just don't really make any physical sense, and they're mathematically pathological, and you should just ignore them and leave it to the mathematicians. Um, but that's actually not uh, the right uh, point of view to take, because this is an example. You know, this is a kernel which, okay, it's people in cloud physics have been using this kernel since the 50s to do stuff with. They do numerical simulations. It kind of sort, sort of agrees with experiments to within <laughs> factor of two that everyone is happy with in cloud physics experiments. And it is, satisfies this criterion of Van Dongen and Ernst to exhibit this instantaneous gelation. So if it's really true that you have a singularity in zero time, why is it uh, that, that people are using this as a model for the, for the physical world? Chris, yeah. So the uh, well, I, 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 would, I would have said yes, but I'm, if I get time, I'm going to show you an example of something which is spatially extended, which exhibits rather similar stuff, and that's actually what, where I want to try to get to. Um, all right, so let me go on a little bit here. So, so let me just, uh, so, so I would argue that the, uh, the in, for these instantaneously gelling kernels, the mean field Smolikovsky equation just really doesn't make any sense. You can't distinguish between two instantaneously gelling systems that just are all zero for all positive time, regardless of what initial condition you put. Uh, now, at least if you take their interpretation of the equations at face value. So let's instead look at this uh, regularized problem again. Put back in this maximum mass cutoff, solve the equations, everything will be fine. There will be no singularity. And try to look at the behavior as you take that cutoff away to infinity. And here is the, the corresponding a numerical picture for one of so for this kernel, which has new three halves, so it should be in this uh, instantaneously gelling regime, and so sure enough, you see that you know as before, every, something at mass is conserved for a while, then it goes down, but now as you increase your cutoff, you see that the time at which the mass is going down uh, seems to be getting less. So if you ex take a big pinch of salt on this and extrapolate to infinite mass, then you might say, well, OK, the result of Van Dongen and Ernst is kind of true. Right? The, the gel time really does, you know, the regularized gel time seems to be decreasing, and maybe it goes to 0 as m tends to infinity. Notice here for these numerics that the cutoff is ranging from 10 to 3 up to 10 to the 11, but the gel time has only shifted by about a factor of 2. So if this is true, this decrease is very, very slow. And so numerical studies and some kind of heuristic arguments and guessing uh, suggests that it's logarithmically slow. Uh, so the regularized gel time decreases as an inverse power of the log of the cutoff. And I would like to argue that that power should be nu minus 1. Hopefully me or someone will show that at some point. 
The fact that the decrease is so slow suggests that such models are, models are indeed physically reasonable. It's this log that's the reason why people can why you can put these kernels into a numerical code and use them. Uh, even if you know you can you need to go to a really huge range of scales before you start to feel the fact that this you know uh, the, to see the distinction between regular gelation and instantaneous gelation. So so the argument that you should just ignore these kernels because of mathematical pathology is not really true. And it's really controlled by mu, as long as mu is bigger than one. But mu doesn't play any role. Mm, that's the belief, yeah. Most of this, I mean, th there's some rigorous work on this, which uh, I'm not really telling, but there, it's been studied quite a lot by probabilists. And, and, and I think the, the new greater than one is, is kind of solid. Exactly what the second exponent does, uh, I, I, would, I think it's not clear. And there's some physical arguments to suspect it may ha play a role, particularly in the case where you have input. But it's pure speculation, I would say. So uh, just to get back, so, so this exchange, this, so that's instantaneous gelation for um, aggregation. For this exchange-driven growth, which I spoke about, the, uh, it's been studied much, much later by, again, by these guys, Ben Naim and Krapivsky, many of us know. And uh, so they looked at the um, race equations for this kernel ij to the gamma and found three <coughs> regimes, again, based on the value of gamma. So there's a no gelation regime for gamma between zero and three halves, regular gelation where the uh, typical cluster size, uh, this is what I was calling S before, so, sorry, bad notation. It's not the total mass, it's the typical uh, size in the system. Um, diverges in finite time for gamma in this range, and if gamma gets bigger than two, you have an instantaneous gelation transition kind of in the same spirit as for Smolikovsky equation. The one comment is that the gelation is, in this model, kind of harder to achieve in the sense that value of gamma is higher. So for, for aggregation, gamma greater than one was enough. Um, well, uh, here the, the nu and mu are the same, both equal to gamma right, in, for that kernel. So <clears throat> you know, for this model, it's a bit harder to get the instantaneous gelation, but you, do, you can get it. And the reason is that you know, the dynamics here allows particles to shrink as well as grow. You know, they can exchange monomers both directions. So, so it's, a bit tough. It's, very, it's a bit tougher to become big. But if your interaction rate grows fast enough as a function of your size, you can again blow up. And so what uh, Ellie and Paul uh, showed, they made some heuristic argument which um, showed that if, if you take a finite system of size n, then the, the, this, of course, will again regularize the, the gelation time. And the regularized gelation time decreases as you make n bigger, and it decreases as an inverse power of the log. Uh, one, uh, you know, ga gamma minus 2 being the exponent, so f for gamma greater than 2, you know, that's, a, that's a negative power. And so the gel time formally uh, is going to go to 0 uh, in the limit as n goes to infinity, but it goes there uh, kind of very slowly. And you know, it's largely on the basis of this argument that I would like to conjecture that it should be nu minus 1 uh, for, 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 my, for my problem here. But this is a bit more solid, but still, I would say, not, not really rigorous. <laughs> it's, it's one of these arguments which is kind of a, a hybridization of finite size system with mean field theory, which is meant to be somehow valid for infinite number. All right, so, so, so that's all, you know, this, you know, inf in instantaneous gelation, strange kind of behavior in, in a number of different types of growth models. Uh, on, until maybe a year or two ago, I would have happily signed up to the idea that it was a mean field effect, or at least zero dimensional, and that if you make any kind of spatially extended model, that you wouldn't be able to see such a thing because you're trying you know, to, to get something <coughs> stuff to blow up so quickly, you need to gather material uh, it's infinitely fast. But it turns out actually that, that there are examples which are rather exhibit rather similar phenomena, uh, which are at least in one dimension. So they're based on this uh, zero range process, uh, well, generalizations of. And I don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm going to skip a bit quickly over this, especially since some of the experts on this are in the audience. And I fear anything I say is likely to be somehow a little bit elementary. But uh, the zero range process is Especially, just for those who don't know it, uh, you have a, a collection of particles which are on a, on a ring. You, know, you can write these things in, in 
an, an arbitrary lattice, but I'm going to stick to a one-dimensional ring periodic. And so you have particles sitting on these sites, multiple occupancy is allowed, and then with some rate which depends on the occupation numbers on both the uh, departing and the target site, uh, particles just hop. Um, the zero range process uh, is specifically the case where the hopping rate depends only on the number of particles on the, on the departure site, and doesn't depend on, on where you're going. Um, more generally, of course, the hopping rate is some function of both. And so particles just jump along the site with these rates. And there are kind of two cases. One is if in kind of symmetric and anti-symmetric transport. So the, you know, there are the kind of two extreme uh, sort of cases. In the asymmetric case, particles are only allowed hop, say, to the right or to the left. It doesn't matter, but convention we consider hopping to the right. In the symmetric case, uh, particles can hop right and left with equal uh, probability. And the point, you know, why I was telling you at, uh, about the exchange-driven growth in, in the first part of the talk is, you know, in some sense, the exchange-driven growth is a mean field analog of this. If there was no space and you would just write down, you know, these, these, the, if you would think of each site as being a, a cluster, uh, particles are only allowed to exchange monomers, but they can go kind of uh, both uh, ways. And, so in some sense, the exchange-driven growth model of Ben Naim and Kropivsky is, is, is a kind of a, a mass action kinetics for these kind of um, mass transport models where you think of sites, lattice sites, as clusters. So the, the kind of cool thing about a lot of these models is uh, uh, that they have... Uh, uh, you know, they go to a stationary state which can be found analytically. There's been a lot of work done on this. So um, the point is that the uh, stationary probability distribution for, uh, for the model is factorizable and is, can be written as uh, a product of single site uh, probability distributions, which can be written down explicitly. And, you know, I guess uh, you know, the, the, these guys have done quite a bit on this. Uh, and others. So I'm going to skip a bit through. So this, the interesting feature of this steady state is that it exhibits what's called a condensation transition, which, is, which I'm going to argue is, has some analogy with this gelation transition in the sense that it's, it corresponds to the formation of a very large um, cluster, which has a, some finite fraction of the total mass in the system. So the, you know, in this, this partition function, you can write down, there's a, a, a chemical potential involved which controls the average particle density. And so if you work out, you know, for a given value of the chemical potential, the expected number of particles per site, uh, you can work it out analytically. And what you find is that it increases monotonically uh, as a function of this chemical potential. And the interesting thing is that um, there, there's some critical value um, of the chemical potential at which the, um, basically the, when you get the, the critical density associated with that is finite when gamma is greater than two. So essentially there's, uh, the, the system, if, if this exponent gamma in these rates, you know, I'm using, trying to use the same notation consistently here. So, so gamma is again the degree of homogeneity of these rates, uh, two gamma for, for, well, for large, at least for large value occupation numbers. So in this model, when gamma is greater than two, there's a, a kind of a finite maximum particle density which uh, the system can support. And if, you, if your initial condition contains more mass than this, then what happens is the excess mass concentrates on a single site. And, and this phenomenon can be accessed analytically in great detail due to the fact that we have an analytic understanding of the form of the stationary probability distribution uh, for, the, for this kind of models. And so this transition which happens as you increase the oops, uh, chemical potential is referred to as the condensation transition. So some finite fraction of the total mass in the steady state is found on a single site. But however, this doesn't tell us anything about the, you know, knowing the steady state doesn't tell us anything about the kinetics of this transition, and that's what I'm interested in. So what I was telling you about in the first half of the talk was evolution happening in time. The gel formed at a finite time. Everything was uh, uh, kinetic. So here, we know that in, in, the, in these mass transport models, 
you know, we know that at time to infinity, if we get to the steady state, we know there'll be a condensate, but knowing that doesn't tell us how that condensate was formed. And that's the question which, well, Stefan Gruskinski, my collaborator on this, has been really especially interested in these kind of questions for a number of years, and I'm kind of getting more into it because of this connection with gelation, perhaps. So this is uh, some snapshots of the zero range process. Um, so this is, you know, here there's no dependence of this uh, hopping rate on the, on the uh, target site. And what you see is that, well, initially you have lots of clusters, of lots of sites with different you know, numbers of particles on there. It, the distribution coarsens, as, so these are subsequent times, and you'll sh almost surely not be able to read these microscopic Ts, but time is increasing as you go this way. And as at the end, I mean, this is getting towards stationarity, you have one site which has a, f a huge number of particles, some finite fraction of the total, and then if you have very sharp eyes, you'll see there's some fluctuations, uh, some background here, uh, which, which uh, persists. So not all of them end up here. So the question is, oh dear, this is really not good. Um, you know, how, what's the time until the condensate forms? Well, the mean field model doesn't really help because according to the work of Ben Naim and Co, the, you know, this regime when gamma is greater than two, the, you have this instantaneous gelation in this model. Um, so the mean field model doesn't help. Now this is the interesting one. Um, so this exp recently, Martin Evans and his uh, his, uh, his postdoc um, they introduced a, mo a variation of this model with totally asymmetric transport, which they found that for in this model here. So so it's basically some. Of it, it's not. It's asymptotically the same as the previous one with gamma greater than two. Then the what they found is that the time to stationarity is again decreasing as a log of the system size L. So this is essentially a model where the, part, the particles hop only to the right, and they're, the, they're accumulate, the, the, as the condensate starts to form, it accumulates mass kind of sufficiently quickly that it can blow up in a time which goes to zero with the system size. So I can show you a movie at the end. But this they called explosive condensation, and I would argue that it's a kind of a spatially extended version of this instantaneous gelation, precisely because the characteristic time to stationarity vanishes in the thermodynamic limit of an infinite lattice. Um, our contribution, you know, we initially, we initially thought, hmm, you know, this is kind of cheating because this thing, because it's only allowed to move to the right, it's and and because it, it's rate of eating monomers is increasing so quickly as it grows. Uh, if you look in the movie, it's basically this, con this uh, condensate is whizzing around the system uh, faster and faster and faster. And he thought, well, it's kind of cheating a little bit because it's a very coherent type of uh, motion that's uh, involved in this. And so we thought, well, probably if you make it symmetric motion, then this won't happen and you can just get rid of this pathology. and. We had our own bias that this instantaneous gelation shouldn't happen in spatially extended systems, despite the fact that there was now an example. So, so what we so we did this, and and we did the car, the the corresponding uh, symmetric case, where part the part, particles can hop each way, and the motion of the condensate is more like diffusion. And what we found is that actually, you can still get this effect, but it's delayed a little bit. Whereas the model of Vaclav and Evans exhibited this explosive condensation for gamma greater than two, our model in the symmetric case, uh, you, you can still do it, but it's just, a little, it's just a bit delayed. You need to go to gamma greater than three. And so our initial guess was wrong, but then we were happy because we could understand a little bit how it happens. Now, interestingly, in between, there's a kind of, a, there's a coarsening regime, you know, where gamma between two and three, uh, where the condensate, time to condensation is is infinite, and we studied this a little bit. But since I'm running out of time, I'll skip over that part. Um, if, you, if people are particularly interested in it, it's on the archive. And we, yeah, maybe I should stop there and let time for with some time for questions. We do have some heuristics on on how this really comes about, um, a kind of a mechanistic explanation for this instantaneous uh, singularity. But let me just 
summarize and leave a minute or two in case people want to ask stuff. So kind of first point is that this instantaneous gelation, I would argue, is a physically relevant phenomenon rather than just purely a mathematical curiosity. But you have to interpret it carefully via some kind of regularization. You know, it's, it's, it's not something that makes sense purely at mean field level naively. Um, the reason why I think it makes physical sense is because you have these slow dependences of the regularized gelation time on your regularization parameter, so it may make it quite difficult to distinguish an instantaneous gelation from a regular finite time gelation in practice. This explosive condensation can be thought of as a spatially extended example of this effect, although I would say the analogy is much closer with the exchange-driven growth model rather than with, with aggregation, which is the kind of spiritual home of these gelation models. And you know, contrary to at least my initial intuition, this explosive conden condensation can indeed occur in models with symmetric mass transport <laughs> dynamics, uh, although the onset is delayed. So you, have, you need to somehow make the, um, make the nonlinearity even stronger uh, compared to the asymmetric and mean field cases for which uh, the, the effect occurs for gamma greater than two. So let me stop there. Thank you. I realize I've kind of brushed all details away, but if, if anyone genuinely is interested, there's more details than you could possibly want in that paper. In the, in the symmetry case uh, for you know, gamma, let's say, bigger than three, do you also have just one single condensate as in the asymmetric case? Uh, eventually, yes, but it's but but it's not. Uh, you know, it's it's basically a, you you have a coarsening process. So one eventually wins, but you have a you have a population of potential winners. In the explosive case, you very quickly see. You know, maybe I should just play the movie. Here, so. In the explosive case, you have one that very quickly becomes the leader, and then this guy. It's very it's completely deterministic after that. In in the Um, I don't. So, so in the symmetric case, are you talking about now about the cor in the coarsening regime or the exploding regime? Case, for example, I mean, there I remember that you know that uh, when you look at the movie mm -hmm. at late times, basically there are two condensates which complete each other, and they sort of you know they go coordinated way mm -hmm. and just uh, you know move around the lattice circuits, and then eventually one of them wins out. Basically. They always, you know, two very close, still very late time, in the Yeah, I don't, in the asymmetric case, I, yeah, I don't know, is the short question. I, my r feeling is that there's really one guy, um, but I would have to check the slinky motion. Yeah, uh, so I, I have a slightly different question. Suppose I uh, uh, consider a system in real space, let's say two or three dimensions. Yeah. And so I start with some particle and give some dynamics, either ballistic or diffusive. So, and then they just merge when they meet, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so at late time, I guess, system will become inhomogeneous, uh, yep. right? And then this, uh, will the Sonsky equation will be valid at late times? It will... Uh, well, this is, exactly, this is exactly the question of interest, I would yeah. say. That, you know, what we, what we typically expect is that when you embed any of these kind of models into space, uh, you, you start to generate spatial correlations, and spatial yeah. correlations will break these kind of mean field things. And I would have always thought that this is the get out of jail uh, free argument for why you shouldn't have this instantaneous effect in, in a spatial model. But the point is here that if you engineer things in such a way that the spatial transport also accelerates as the particle growth accelerates, which is exactly what these, you know, here the, the growth and the transport are intrinsically linked due to this particle exchange. So as the growth increases, so does the rate of hopping. So, by, and it, so basically the, the spatial transport can be fast enough that you keep mixing very, very strongly and erase spatial correlations. So, so in a sense, you know, you're, you're right, but these models get around this by, by essentially mixing at a rate which is also blowing up in time. Okay. And at the, yeah. Yeah, and at the initial time, can I guess this exponent uh, mu and this, like starting with either, either ballistic aggregation or some diffusive aggregation model in real space? I mean, what, what is the kernel correspond to that? Uh, 
I mean, if I just do a simulation, just particle moving and just uh, they just whenever they meet, they just get aggregate. Uh, so can one uh, guess this mu or uh, new? Can you guess? And so you mean for this uh, for these mass transport models? Uh, the initial one you you had written this uh, the kernel for the small scale equation. I mean, I guess initially one can write down a mean field kind of equation, right? Mm. That's all ah. correct. So you say, can, could, could I guess a kernel, could I somehow construct a kernel which takes into account the space? Yeah. Sometimes, yes. I, mean, I know of one example where you can do this, which is the constant kernel aggregation uh, in, in, in low dimensions. There you can take into account, in some sense, spatial correlations by a renormalization of the kernel. You have a sort of effective mass dependence comes about. But in general, whether you can always do this other than just empirically from numerics, I, I don't know. My guess is that it would be very hard. Okay, let's uh, thank the speaker again.